1944, the Detroit chapter of the NAACP held a mock funeral for him. In 1963, participants in the March on Washington, D.C. for Jobs and Freedom symbolically buried him. Racial discrimination existed throughout the United States in the 20th century, but it had a special name in the South. Jim Crow. Over 53 years ago, President Lyndon B. Johnson tried to bury Jim Crow by signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law. The Voting Rights Act and its predecessor, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, fought racial discrimination in the South by banning segregation in public accommodations and outlawing the poll taxes and tests that were used to stop African Americans from voting. Today we still use Jim Crow to describe that system of segregation and discrimination in the South, but the system's namesake isn't actually Southern. Jim Crow came from the North. Thomas Dartmouth Rice, a white man, was born in New York City in 1808. He devoted himself to the theater. In his 20s and in the early 1830s, he began performing an act that would make him famous. He painted his face black and did a song and dance, and he claimed they were inspired by a southern slave he saw. The act was called Jim Crow, or Jumping Jim Crow. He would put on not only black-faced makeup, but shabby dress that imitated in his mind and white people's minds of the time the dress and aspect and demeanor of the southern enslaved black person. Wheel about and turn about and do just so Every time I wheel about I jump Jim Crow Rice's routine was a hit in New York City, one of many places in the North where working class whites could see blackface minstrelsy, which was quickly becoming a dominant form of theater and leading source of popular music in America. Rice took his act on tour, even going as far as England, and as popularity grew, his stage name steeped into the culture. Jumping Jim Crow and Just Jim Crow generally sort of became shorthand, or one shorthand anyway, for describing African Americans in this country, says Professor Lott. So much so, he says, that by the time of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was 20 years later in 1852, one character refers to another as Jim Crow. In a strange full circle, Rice later played Uncle Tom in blackface stage adaptations of the novel, which often reversed the book's abolitionist message. Regardless of whether the term Jim Crow existed before Rice took it to the stage, his act helped popularize it as a derogatory term for African Americans. To call someone Jim Crow wasn't just to point out his or her skin color, it was to reduce that person to the kind of character that Rice performed on stage. After the Civil War, southern states passed laws that discriminated against newly freed African Americans. And as early as the 1890s, these laws had gained a nickname. Jim Crow Laws In 1899, North Carolina's Goldsboro Daily Argus published an article referring to a Jim Crow law.
Experts don't really know how a racist performance in the North came to represent racist laws and policies in the South, but they can speculate. Since the phrase originated in blackface minstrelsy, Lott says that it's almost perversively accurate that it should come to be the name for official segregation and state-sponsored racism. I think probably in the popular white mind, he says, it was just used because that's just how they referred to black people. Sometimes in history a movie comes out or a book comes out and it just changes the language and you can point at it, says David Pilgrim, director of the Jim Crow Museum and pres vice president for diversity and inclusion at Ferris State University. The much celebrated yet infamous silent film, Birth of a Nation, was just that sort of moment in the history of filmmaking. Released in 1915 and directed by celebrated filmmaker D.W. Griffith, the film reimagined a white supremacist view of events from the Civil War through the creation of the KKK following Reconstruction. As one recent reviewer said on the 100th anniversary of the film's release, the problem with Birth of a Nation is just how good it is. Today it is both revered as a masterpiece of early cinema and reviled as a white supremacist racist propaganda. However it happened, the new meaning stuck. Blackface minstrelsy's popularity faded, but never died, and T.D. Rice is barely remembered. Most people today don't know his name, but everybody knows Jim Crow. So let's fast forward past the civil rights movement of the 1960s and into the increasingly divisive times we live in today. Should Virginia's governor be removed from office for dressing up in a picture with a person in blackface and another in KKK outfit? Or should we write this behavior off as a mistake that was made 30 years ago? Does our behavior as a society carry consequences for ourselves and our future generations? These are the questions that we must tackle in a time full of conflict and bitter divisiveness. <laughs>